Good evening, everyone. Our call to worship on this special Thursday evening, this Ascension Day, comes from um, the Psalms. Clap your hands, all you peoples. God has gone up with a shout of joy. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen to reign. His is the name above all names. We are witnesses. The Lord is risen. Christ has ascended to reign on high. Come, let us worship our God. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you this evening for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he did not stay in the grave, but that he conquered death, that he is the first fruits of a glorious resurrection which is to come. And this encourages us so much as we live this life, thankful for the life you've given us, but eager for the life which is to come, which is a better life by far. And so we thank you that we have this promise in his flesh, which is in heaven. He has now ascended to be at your right hand on the throne. And we thank you for the ascended Jesus. Jesus, we praise you that you intercede for us, that you are our great high priest who has gone through the heavens for us. And so we can come boldly before the throne of grace in your name, on the basis of your work. And we confess that we need this because we are needy servants of yours. You are our Lord and Master. We are your servants. Bless us, we pray. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, both this evening and at all times. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Receive God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. And now let's sing from Psalm 47, which we referenced there in the call to worship. Oh, clap your hands, four verses from number 47a. Another psalm which speaks of the ascended Lord and the glory that is his and how he receives that glory is Psalm 24. So let's sing the earth and the riches, number 24a.
We're now going to have uh, three scripture readings consecutively. The first one is from John chapter 14 and John 16, pieces of that. And uh, you'll hear someone reading that, and that text will be displayed for you, just the, uh, the reference on the screen. So you'll be listening to a reader. And then following that, we'll read Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and then after that, Acts 1, 1 through 11. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in, in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than this will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. John 16, 5 to 16. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 6 to 20, ESV. Acts 1.1. 1, 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, 
until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. All right, we're going to sing now. Having heard those New Testament readings, let's sing once more a psalm, Psalm 68. God shall arise and by his might. We're going to sing three verses, uh, verse 1, 7, and 12. And this psalm speaks of God going up, ascending in glory as well, and it sees its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 4 makes clear. So let's sing.
we're going to have a reading from one of our confessional documents, the Heidelberg Catechism, which summarizes Scripture's teaching on the Ascension in Lord's Day 18. Question 46. What do you mean by saying he ascended to heaven? That Christ, while his disciples watched, was taken up from the earth into heaven and remains there on our behalf until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Question 47. But isn't Christ with us until the end of the world as he promised us? Christ is true man and true God. In his human nature, Christ is not now on earth, but in his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is never absent from us. Question 48. If his humanity is not present, wherever his divinity is, then aren't the two natures of Christ separated from each other? Certainly not. Since divinity is not limited and is present everywhere, it is evident that Christ's divinity is surely beyond the bounds of the humanity that has been taken on. But at the same time, his divinity is in and remains personally united to his humanity. Question 49. How does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? First, he is our advocate in heaven in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that Christ, our head, will also take us his members, up to himself. Third, he sends his spirit to us on earth as a corresponding pledge. By the spirit's power, we seek not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you that Jesus has ascended that's why we're here to celebrate tonight his ascension. And, and particularly, we thank you and praise you for the power that is displayed in this, for the, the glory that is due to you, Father, Son, and Spirit, as we've just heard uh, through our catechism reading as well. As we sung through Psalm 68, we praise God and shout his glory for it. Everyone, kings and kingdoms of the earth, Lord, we're here to praise you this evening. Help us to do so in spirit and in truth. Encourage us from Revelation chapter 5 as we consider that passage now. Speak to us by your spirit, from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let's read now Revelation chapter 5. And I'd like to highlight particularly the, the phrase, Weep no more, for the lion has conquered. Weep no more, for the lion has conquered. You see that in verse 5. This is in the middle of John's vision. If you're familiar with Revelation, you, you remember that at the beginning of chapter 4, um, John was told, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And there was a vision of the throne room of heaven and chapter 4 began that and chapter 5 continues that. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp 
and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Brothers and sisters and boys and girls, the book of Revelation is an interesting book, isn't it? There are different views that people have on this book. Some people find it so intriguing some people find it a little concerning in the, in the imagery that it presents. Some people are confused by it. They don't know what to make of this book. Well, the book of Revelation, I hope we'll see even more after this evening, is a book of great comfort and blessing. If you consider what its purpose is, it's a book written to the fledgling church. Yes, it's for the church of all times and places, but particularly it's to the church uh, at the end of the first century, facing persecution, oppression, pressure of every kind. They're, they were facing the demands of the Roman Empire to worship Caesar as God, and not their own God, or at least not their own God only. They were facing the demands of the culture, all the influences that, that the pagan culture was, was sending to them as far as it related to sexual immorality, uh, in terms of self-sufficiency and their views on, on wealth. And there's other heretical teachings as well. We read of these things in the letters to the seven churches. So there's all these pressures, all this persecution, all this oppression, and in the face of all of this, John comes to say, and the Spirit says through John, be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Christ has conquered. That's the first truth, the first great truth of the book of Revelation. Christ Jesus has conquered. He is, as chapter 1 says, the faithful witness. We heard these words earlier. The firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He has won for you grace and peace and freedom from your sins. So that's the first great truth. Christ Jesus has conquered. And the second one, He is coming again. He is coming. Chapter 1 says, Behold, He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see Him. And the dominion and the glory will belong to Him and Him alone forever and ever. And all who are His will share in His glory. An encouragement. So two encouragements. Christ has conquered. Christ is coming. And so then there's this exhortation that the book of Revelation gives. Hold fast. Hold fast. Hold on. Hold fast. To Thyatira, we read this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 25. Only hold fast what you have until I come. To Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 11. I am coming soon. I'm coming, not only am I coming, I am coming soon. Hold fast then what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. This is the book of Revelation and its message for its original audience. But brothers and sisters, this is also a message much needed for us. We need to hear this. We don't exactly face the same struggles as the the early church did in the sense that our context is different than theirs, but but many of the struggles parallel each other. And so we're in need of the same encouragement. And we're also in need of the same exhortation to hold fast. So the book of Revelation is a book of comfort and blessing for us too. And there's this neat thing that's done in the book. Every few chapters we get a glimpse of glory. Chapter 5 is one of those chapters to just help us as we go along to hold fast. The glory is coming. And so let's meditate on the glory of the ascended Christ together 
this evening through this chapter. Well, even before chapter 5, as I said, chapter 4 is quite connected with it. It's the beginning of this vision of the throne room of heaven. We, we find stated that God is glorious. The glory belongs to God. Revelation 4 uses the word worthy. It's the word you'll see in your Bible. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. That's not to say that glory and honor and power didn't already belong to God, but to receive it is to say to be acknowledged as the one who is glorious, the one who deserves all honor, and the one who is all-powerful. You are worthy of this. Makes me think of the Psalms, Psalm 96, for example. Ascribe to the Lord glory. Give to the Lord the glory that is His. That sort of idea. Why? Why is God so worthy of all of this glory and this honor? Well, because He's great. He's he's powerful. He's the ruler of all things. He's the creator, especially, chapter 4 ends saying, of all things. Well, if God is so great, then what's wrong? What could be wrong if God is so powerful and so great? Why is John weeping? He's weeping because the scroll is sealed. We're introduced to this scroll at the beginning of chapter 5. You say, well, what's really the big deal about a scroll? The scroll symbolizes the message from God, a message from God. And scrolls normally uh, were not uh, written on both sides within and on the back. It's interesting that Ezekiel, uh, chapter 2 and 3, we have a reference to a double-sided scroll, um, a similar kind of scroll to this. And what is Ezekiel? He's a prophet. A prophet brings the message from God to his people. Scrolls, the scroll symbolizes the message from God to his people. And the fact that it's sealed means you can't know that message. It's sealed. That's a problem. You can't, you can't know it. And, and a seal is a symbol of authority. So that is to say that only one who is authorized can break this seal. And this isn't just any message that this scroll represents, but it is the message. This represents God's plans, God's purposes for all of history. And so to open this scroll would be to reveal those plans. And not only to reveal those plans, but to carry them out, to make them happen. Through the opening, they are able to be carried out. So it's to open the scroll is to announce the message and to act the message, to accomplish it. And so this is why John is weeping. He's saying, who is worthy to do all this? Who is Who can reveal God's plan to the world? Who can carry out God's plan for the world? And the answer, he thinks, is no one. Verse 3, no one in the universe, heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Brothers and sisters and boys and girls, do you weep? Do you weep? What do you weep about? There are plenty of reasons that people weep. Some of those reasons are are selfish and childish. I think of children, young children, some of the things that they cry about, and then we say those aren't things worth crying about. But then they grow up, and they grow out of that, at least most of us do. But sometimes we weep over things that are very legitimate to weep over. Death, illness, tragedies of other natures, just the evil that's in the world, the brokenness that's in, out there and in our lives as well. Worthwhile things to weep about. So is that what you weep about? There's a lot of ways we can respond to the sin and the, the brokenness that exists in this world. We can be complacent, indifferent. We can be angry, fearful. But do we weep? Do we weep about our need for the forgiveness of our sins? Do we weep for the disorder and corruption that we see in the visible church today? Do we weep for those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ? Do we weep for a perishing world? This is what makes John weep. He understands that there's no hope for the world if the seal is not broken, if the scroll is not opened. There's no hope if there is no one who is found worthy. Well, then praise God that there is one who was found worthy. Jesus is 
worthy. Jesus is the fulfillment of all God's promises. Jesus is the one who is able to carry out his plan of salvation. And so John is, is shown this in his vision. Look, he's told. One of the elders says, behold, stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And in this name that Jesus has given, we see the fulfillment of all the scriptures, don't we? We could go back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 49, and we, we see at the end of that book, Jacob, as he's dying, is blessing his sons. And he comes to his fourth son, who we know is the son in whom the line is going to continue leading to Christ, right? And he says to Judah, you are a lion, O Judah. You are a conqueror. You are a figure of authority. You will rule forever. And, and, and those words would have been amazing in the time, but how much more amazing are they to us? And so we see how the line goes from Judah to David, and then there's all these kings in the line of David, but then the people go to exile. It seems like the line has been cut off. It seems dead. And yet we have a prophet like Isaiah say this, Isaiah 11, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. A, a, a fruitful branch will come from a seemingly lifeless root, the root of David. And it's Jesus. We come to Matthew 1, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We see the genealogy. Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. Anointed for what? Well, to be king. He is the son of David. He is we could say, the lion king. And that makes sense, doesn't it? This idea of a lion. David, the warrior who defeated Goliath, who defeated enemy nations, um, slaying his, his ten thousands, right? He, he's this warrior king. And the lion will conquer as well. Well, surprise. What happens? You see, John is told, look, here's the lion. John had been told this before, chapter 1, a little different, but John had heard, and then he saw. Chapter 1, John heard a trumpet-like voice. Sounds kind of glorious and magnificent, a trumpet-like voice. And then he saw one who was like a son of man. And this son of man was glorious. And, and you look at the description in chapter 1, the, 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 the eyes like blazing fire, and you think this is a, the picture of one who's like a warrior. That's often the message there, isn't it? That Christ has conquered. It's coming right at the beginning of the book. So now again, John hears first. He hears, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Makes sense. But then he turns, and he sees a lamb. You say, what? Not a lion. Not even a powerful ram or something like that. But a lamb. A lamb standing as though it has been slain. It just doesn't make sense. And you know, Jesus didn't make sense to the people of this time. Jesus didn't make sense to the first century mind. How can you conquer if you won't get rid of the Romans? How can you be our king if you choose the path of suffering? Why, why go to your death willingly like a lamb being led to the slaughter? It's so foolish. You are foolish, Jesus, is the mentality of the people. And yet, what did Jesus do? He did conquer. He walked the hardest path that anyone had ever walked, and he defeated all the obstacles that were put before him. And by his death, he defeated the enemy once and for all, ransoming people for God from every tribe and every language and every nation. And so the lamb, we could say, has surprising strength. And that's symbolized in the seven horns and the seven eyes. You see that in verse 6, this description of the lamb. A horn symbolizes strength, and the eye symbolizes knowledge, seeing, insight. And so to, to say seven horns and seven eyes, seven being that number of completeness, is to say the lion lamb has all power and all knowledge. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's God. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters, that this lamb, this lamb looking as if as one that has been slain is your king, the head of the church. Jesus, who after rising from the dead, ascended into heaven 
And he sits there in glory even now, reigning. And you say, really? Or perhaps you don't say that, but people may say, really? That's kind of surprising that you would say he's reigning. That doesn't really make sense. How can you say that when there's so many people who lie and cheat and are prosperous because of it? How can you say that when physical, sexual, and verbal abuse is so rampant? How can you say that when war and violence are so common? How can you say that when so many people suffer from sickness and die, regardless of their age, if it's a tragedy? How can, how can you say these things, that Jesus is reigning? And yet Jesus is reigning, brothers and sisters. The seven eyes of the Lamb. We're told they are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The seven spirits, that is to say, the Holy Spirit. And so the Lamb is with us. Jesus is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He's ascended into heaven, but he still can say to the churches in these letters, I know. I know. I, ha I have knowledge. I have insight because I am with you. I am walking among you. He's told, we're told he's walking among the lampstands, that is the churches, even as the ascended Lord. Because his spirit powerfully dwells within us and he reigns in our hearts as the all-knowing and all-powerful one. So do you see this? Do we see his reign? Do we experience it? Well, you know, you see it in the power of a martyr's confession as they die, confessing Jesus as Lord. You see it in the unshakable faith of a believer who's in the midst of a great tragedy, and yet that faith is so strong. You see it in the transformation of an individual's heart upon being converted to faith, and you see this person go from being angry to being peaceful, from being violent to being loving, and you see that transformation. You see this in the healing of a family or a community. And, and you see the, that how that comes about, the supernatural grace and humility and love that exists. This is the reign of God. This is Jesus' power at work in our lives. And so the Lamb is the Lion. The suffering servant, we could say, is the ascended Lord. He has immense power and majesty and strength. And he's uncompromising. And he's almighty. And he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. He's gone up. He's ascended. He's coming back. And at that time, the power of the Lamb will be most clear. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, speaks of God's wrath being poured out in the presence of the Lamb. And so God's wrath will be poured out on all those who reject the lion lamb, but then he will take all his chosen ones to himself into the joy and the glory of heaven. And so in light of that, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, do we need to weep? Well, perhaps from time to time, we're still experiencing brokenness in, in this world. That's a reality. But one day weeping will totally give way to complete and unstoppable joy. Because we are assured of that, because we know that and because we believe that, we can have joy. We should already have joy now as we taste and see that the Lord is great and that the Lord is good. So he is worthy. Sing, worthy is the Lamb. Sing that often. To him be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we do indeed praise you for your worthiness. You've created all things by your will. Everything that is exists and was created. There's nothing that exists apart from you. You are worthy of our worship, our praise, our life. And even more so than for your creation, despite our fall into sin and our rebellion, you have saved us in Jesus. And Jesus, you are worthy. Worthy uh, to fulfill the plan of salvation for so many people. That we are not left in our sin and our misery. We are not abandoned. 
to that faith, which is ours by right. But we have been shown mercy and grace and love. We've been ransomed because we are precious to you, O God. Not because of anything within us, but because you have determined that we should be precious to you. And so we are your kingdom and priests. And what precious promises these are. What great promises these are that we are kings and priests to our God. And that one day we will reign on the earth. And so Jesus, we say, worthy are you to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing now, See the Conqueror Mounts in Triumph. This is a great hymn we have of the Ascension, and these lyrics uh, go so nicely with what we've been considering. We're going to sing this hymn to the tune of Come Now, Found of Every Blessing. And then let's also sing by the sea of crystal a, a great doxology as we consider the hope we have in glory.
God's parting blessing upon you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Oh.